Welcome to Sponsored Post, behind the lens of how influential content is made. I am Justin Moore, founder and CEO of Trending Family, which is an influencer marketing agency that launches campaigns with family-friendly influencers. Today, I am so excited to be joined by Ebony from Team Two Moms. They have several hundred thousand followers across platforms like YouTube and Instagram and are an inspiration to so many. They're coming up on their nine-year marriage anniversary, and they've got three beautiful children together. Welcome, Ebony. Hi. Thank you so much, Justin, for having me. I am super duper excited to be a part of this podcast. I'm so excited. Absolutely. Absolutely. So why don't we start off? Uh, why don't you share your background story? You know, how did you two meet? How did you first start doing YouTube? Sure. So I'm one fifth of Team Two Moms. That's what I like to say. There's, we're a family of five. My wife's name is Denise, and we've been together for over a decade, 13 years to be exact. My wife and I, we met on a little website called MySpace. I'm sure some people are familiar with that. You know, my wife sent me a little message. Can we be friends to be exact? And hence, 13 years later, we are together. We have been married for nine years. Like you said, our anniversary just passed. So we just celebrated that. Looking forward to our 10 year anniversary next year. We have three beautiful children. We have our daughter, Olivia, who I carried. She's seven years old, and we have twin boys who my wife carried who are two years old. And yeah, we have started YouTube when Olivia was just one or two. It was definitely very inconsistent. We didn't have a mission or a purpose when we first started. We just wanted to, you know, randomly upload a video about our family. And at the time, it was during former President Obama's re-election, and we just wanted to make a video about that. But long and behold, everybody who watched the video, even though we're not talking specifically about us being a two-mom family and that this is our daughter, everybody's feedback and comments under that particular video was, wait a minute, you guys are two moms, you have a daughter, how do you have a daughter, how is this possible? And that's when we realized that there's just this whole space in the world that needs more education, more reinforcement of same-sex couples and LGBTQ plus parenting. So that's pretty much in a nutshell how we met and how Team Two Moms started. That's so fascinating. And so at that time, when you made that video, you were just starting YouTube. Was there not as much a representation of same-sex couples on YouTube that you found? There was not. Barely any. There was a handful of us on YouTube, but nobody, including us, was very consistent with the uploads, with, you know, having a strong presence on the platform. So I, I definitely feel like we are one of the trailblazers in representing LGBTQ plus parenting on the platform. That's so interesting. And, you know, when you engage with your audience and you're making content, does that kind of inform the content you're creating? Because I have to imagine that your role models to so many, you know, so many people who may not have those people to look up to in their real lives, you know, in their day to day. And so how do you think about that responsibility? You know, it definitely wasn't our initial intent. We definitely adopted the role and being role models on the platform. And we handle it in a sense of we know what's needed. And because we know that this representation is needed, it's it gives us the feel to continue and to create our content. I mean, we're literally just modeling our lives. We're not doing anything out of the ordinary or, or extra. It's literally just us living our lives day to day and the lessons and the challenges that we may face and sharing that with our audience because we are sure that many can learn from our experiences. And it's kind of a two-way street, you know, being that we receive comments or emails. And, and I'm sure you can relate, you get the feedback and other people's experience. And that also feels as content to share on your channel as well. So overall, I feel as though we've just created such a really great, engaging community that just makes us being who we are so natural and so effortlessly. And we just appreciate the fact that people appreciate that we are sharing our lives on the platform. Incredible. Yeah. And, and so making all of this content over the years, would you 
treat YouTube or do you think of YouTube as your kind of primary platform still? Yeah, I would say YouTube and Instagram is like a close race right there as our main platforms. Mm -hmm. And and so how has your following grown over the years? Has it been very organic or has it been kind of a, a very slow build over time? Or were there moments like that initial video you mentioned you made around 2008 where there was like a breakout moment? It's a little bit of both. You know, we've had like, I call it slow and steady, a slow and steady build of our audience, but we've had pocket moments, which we call hero moments in our lives that has definitely generated a spike or an increase in our following. And one in in particular is when we documented our journey of having the twins and sharing that journey of Denise going through trying to conceive. And once the twins were born, there was definitely a boost in our following as well. So it's a little bit of both, slow and steady with some pockets of some little spikes here and there. So why do you think there is such a cyclical nature with respect to those major life moments on YouTube? Because I, I, I definitely think that, you know, most acknowledge that that's a trend, right? Pregnancy or buying a house or, you know, there's these kind of major moments and milestones in people's lives. And so why do you think that there's so much interest from your followers with those types of moments? I think that they're just extremely relatable moments that most hope or have or did go through in their life. And, you know, your day-to-day in between those hero moments, you know, they vary. They vary significantly. You know, you yourself don't know what tomorrow may bring. So, you know, whether your audience will connect or not to that, those hero moments are definitely more relatable and connectable for, you know, for our viewers. I think it's the suspense, the intensity sometimes of like being pregnant, giving birth and people wanting to know what that experience is about. I think that's why people seem to be more drawn to those hero moments and you're able to like capture a bigger audience. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. And and so, you know, as you've evolved as people, as a channel, do you remember when brands first started reaching out to you, you know, wanting to partner with you? Do you remember what the first brand was that ever reached out to you? Wow, that's a great question. The first brand that ever reached out to us, it wasn't so much a brand, but it was a nonprofit organization. It was It Gets Better which is an LGBTQ plus nonprofit organization that we had did some work with. And they already have an established audience. So partnering with them definitely had helped us to kind of get the name of our channel out there as well. But a brand other than a nonprofit organization probably was, I want to say Tylenol was our first big brand deal that we had. And so tell me a little bit about that campaign. You know, I think one of the things that's always very interesting is, you know, when you're first starting to work with the brand as a creator who's used to creating everyday organic content, it's a little bit different, right? I mean, you're you're sharing your everyday life, you're sharing these moments that are very authentic, but then when brands first start wanting to work with you, I imagine that there's I don't know, a concern that you don't want to alienate your audience that you've built up over many years. And you want to make sure that any brand that you're partnering with is an authentic fit to your life already. So tell me a little bit about that thought process of how you decide whether you're going to work with a brand. I think the first thing that we look at when we're partnering with the brand is what type of content do you want to create? What is the purpose of this collaboration together? And when we do decide to partner with a brand, it's because that message that the brand is trying to get out already mirrors or mimics our morals and our values and the message that we put on our platform as well. So it goes back into exactly what you said is making sure it's authentic to who we are already. And we're just kind of integrating the brand into what we already do or speak about or use. And that's been literally every single brand partnership that we've ever collaborated with somehow fits with us very organically and authentically. I also look for with brands is the fact that they want a partnership, that they're not just tapping into us because it's LGBTQ plus Pride Month. 
they are tapping into us because they realize or they believe that they need to show more representation that represents or matches their consumer, their audience. So that's what we pretty much look for as well. That's so fascinating. And tell me a little bit more about that, because I, I definitely have heard, you know, I think that there's been conversations about this in, in greater pop culture, especially with Pride Month. You know, there are some brands who just kind of change their logo to be a rainbow or, you know, they're not really fully committed to LGBTQ plus causes. And, and yet they're you know wanting to kind of um, outwardly show that to the community. And so tell me a little bit about how you think about that. How do you determine whether a brand is actually committed to the causes that are important to you? So this is what we do. And we were very firm with it this year, especially with it being World Pride. And we knew a lot of brands were going to tap into the fact that it was World Pride. And what we did is before we initiated anything with them, we asked them to send us a bio, something that they've been continuously doing with or for the LGBTQ plus community so that we could you know, get the sense of the brand and what the LGBTQ plus community means to them. So that is what we definitely made sure to do. So for example, am I allowed to say specific brands? Absolutely. Okay. So for example, with Listerine, they had a pride bottle come out in the month of June. They had several different products. J&J had come out with a pride rainbow on the actual product itself. And we were absolutely positively concerned just by looking at that alone, just at the product itself, because you're just slapping a, a rainbow flag on a product, but what is this doing for the LGBTQ plus community? How is this enriching? How is this getting us closer to equality? Tell me what you are doing, because I know for a fact our audience is going to say, oh, look, another brand just slapping a rainbow on the product. So we had a conference call with the team at Listerine, and they were able to talk to us and tell us the amount of dollars that they've been continuously for like the past eight years investing into several different nonprofit organizations, specifically with Glisten, the Human Rights Campaign, the It Gets Better Project. And that made us feel so good so that when I now post about the content, I'm able to incorporate that into it. So that A, it's also well received, of course, by our audience. And B, the fact that you would want this as a brand to be recognized for these things, because these are things that don't really get out. They're not really written about. It's really when a brand messes up or says something or or does something to offend, and then it's all over the media. But when they're doing this great work, it's barely ever, you know, recognized or put out there as something that these brands are doing. So we like to try to find that out first and then, you know, see if it's right for us. That's really fascinating. And I think speaks to a really crucial thing for a lot of brands to realize, which is that rather than tapping into influencers just as a one-time thing, you know, here, talk about my product, here's the features and the benefits the authentic creators, the authentic influencers want to be armed with all of this additional information. And when those questions come up with their audience, they want to be able to talk about all those different things. And so I think, yeah, that's a, that's a really critical point. And so talk a little bit about that, about these kind of one-off partnerships versus these more extended collaborations that you're able to forge with the brand. Have you been able to establish those longer term partnerships? Yeah, I would definitely say most of the brand partnership, especially since 2018 into 2019, have been a continuous partnership, whether it's with the third party agency that brought the opportunity to our attention or the brand themselves. So I would say literally probably about 90% of them have been a continuous partnership. I honestly can't even think of an example right now of a partnership that was like a one or done. That's fantastic. And have you noticed that, you know, because I mean, several years ago, I I think that, you know, most people were doing one and done, you know, they weren't really thinking of, they were just looking at an influencer as kind of a distribution channel, right? You know, here's the product, here's the message, just post it on your channel, right? And now it's interesting that you're saying that you're seeing much more of a significant shift towards these longer term collaborations. 
Yes. And especially with bigger brands. I mean, there are, you know, startup companies that we would definitely still work with and they're still learning the industry and learning, working with influencers. I don't like to be called influencer. I like to be just called a digital creator or, or creative, but yeah, the, you know, there's definitely companies that are still learning, but the fact that they're willing to learn and willing to get your feedback and your input and, and how to approach creators is also a great sign as well that it's moving in the right direction. Interesting. And so talk a little bit about how you deal with negative reactions to sponsored content, you know, whether, you know, personally as a digital creator, as well as how you counsel your brand partners about how to interpret those types of reactions. They don't happen often. And when we do get a negative response, because it's not overwhelming, we don't necessarily respond directly to those who are commenting negatively. However, if it was like, for example, we partnered with Johnson's Baby, we're still in partnership with Johnson's Baby. And of course, they have been recently in the media in regards to the talc and, you know, different things that are going on in the media that's not good press for the brand. And what we do definitely offline and online is have a deeper conversation. This is where we kind of ask for the third party to kind of like step back and let us talk directly with the brand to give us enough resources and information just in case it does get to the point where we need to, I don't want to say defend the brand or defend why we are choosing to partner with this brand, but rather reciprocate the negative information to what the positive are and why what they're saying is indeed not factual. So we just try to be like, you, and you used the perfect word earlier, armed. We just try to be armed with as much information. And I think as creators, that's a big responsibility on us when we are partnering with brands to get as much information and not just look at what the compensation is for partnering with the brand. You really should learn and know about the brand because it affects how your brand is to your audience if you're partnering with the wrong brands. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so when a brand first contacts you, how do you measure success when you're partnering with a brand? Like, what are they looking to accomplish? Is it primarily that they're wanting you to talk about their product or their service and your content? Are they wanting to use your content in a larger advertising campaign, you know, where they're posting it on their social media channels? Or are they wanting to, you know, use your video to embed on their website? Or what are the typical kind of scope and deliverables that you're typically doing for your brand partners? It's definitely a variation of us creating the content to them using the content in addition to it being posted live on our platforms to them posting it on their socials. We are getting now a lot of inquiries when we do partner with brands for the permission for them to use it, to whitelist, to do these different things which as the creator is, is very great and flattering that you know they use our socials for their campaigns and so forth. But also we've had the opportunities where something as simple as us making an Instagram post has down the road turned into a campaign for them, specifically, you know, with H&M. We worked with H&M once last year and they remembered us from that one campaign that we did. It wasn't even a campaign directly through H&M. It was through Pop Sugar who was doing a piece with H&M and how different families style their kids. And so from that opportunity, it has led into a full year partnership where we are going to be part of several different campaigns and activations with H&M and pretty much where they're ambassadors. And that's where I think, you know, as digital creators, we need to push and move forward to as ambassador programs when brands create that. That's a whole new ballgame. And now having that opportunity of what an ambassador program is and being a part of an ambassador program, I think that's a good way to kind of measure our success with a partnership with a brand. Like we hope to move into that ambassadorship with them. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, if I think back to the early days of blogging, I think ambassadorship was much more prevalent, you know, when quote unquote influencer marketing started happening, especially on social like YouTube, Instagram, you know, it's been you know kind of this evolution that shifted to kind of these one off posts. And then now we're coming full circle right back to, you know, these ambassadorships. So it's super interesting. One of the things you mentioned about this collaboration with Pop Sugar and H&M about styling your kids, talk a little bit about what it's been like raising your children 
on camera. You know, uh, Olivia was quite young when you first started doing YouTube and she's seven now, right? Yes, she's seven. Yes. Yeah. So those are formative years, right? For her and, and for you both and your family. So talk a little bit about what that process has been like, both how you choose which moments to share and which moments you choose not to share and how you think about evolving your children and working with brands. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, definitely. Firstly, we love working with our kids. But of course, at times, especially with our twins, since they're so young, it can definitely be challenging to work with your children on social media and, you know, with even different brands and doing photo shoots and campaigns and so forth. But it's definitely been a great journey working with them. But we definitely make sure to always keep our parenting hat up front and most forward when it comes to our children. So, you know, for example, we're very cautious on the safety of our children. You know, a specific example is when we are recording our own content for our channel. We make sure not to include locations like addresses, what school our daughter goes to, you know, different things to try to keep them safe because that is our utmost priority. But overall, we just make sure to keep our parenting hat first. If Olivia doesn't feel like record, if she doesn't feel like take a photo, we will not. Same with the boys, you know. When she feels like it, then great, we'll make it work during those moments. You know, schoolwork first, not the internet. So we definitely prioritize our children before anything. Yeah, ab- absolutely. It's it's so fascinating. And, and, you know, I think when you think of this new kind of realm of digital creators, especially with kids who have some notoriety, it's a little bit different than the notion of a traditional celebrity, right? I mean, if you think of a traditional movie star's kid or something, right, oftentimes they're homeschooled or they have uh, bodyguards or nannies. Uh-huh. I don't know, just for the most part, digital creators who have some notoriety are are normal people, right? And, you know, they're not, they live in normal neighborhoods, their kids go to public schools, like it's a very normal thing. So do you ever think about that in terms of, you know, people who watch your content and watch other creators content? I think that's one of the attractions, right? The fact that you're just normal people, right? Exactly, exactly. That's definitely the most relatable factor of being a creator online. Because again, it goes back to the fact that we're not creating unordinary content for us. It is just literally our day-to-day lives and our experiences and our challenges. So I think definitely, you know, showing that part of our lives and the the craziness at times and the quirkiness at times is definitely extremely relatable. So at this point, you have a ton of experience creating content and working with brands. If you had to list, uh, let's say, the top three key recommendations about the best way to work with a channel like yours, what would that be? One for the brand to allow the creator to create a concept that is authentic and true to them with still embedding the key messaging points from the brand. Because sometimes you do receive these like three page sheets with so many bullet points and minute details where you know your audience is not going to be receptive to them. So a lot of creators to kind of give their feedback too as well as what will work with their audience while still getting the message or the key messaging that you want to come across. So how do you go back to the brand and talk to them about that piece? You know, because I think that that's a very common piece of feedback that creators give brands is, like you said, they get this multi-page influencer brief or creative brief. I mean, there's all this background about the brand and there's you know 10 different required key messaging. How do you go back and speak with the brand or the PR agency? Do you say, you know, these are the three that we'd actually like to talk about? Or do you have to have a larger conversation and say, look, you need to go back and talk with the brand and, and make this much more succinct? So what we do is every time before I even remotely begin creating is I send through a concept and it's a very detailed concept. And I do this with every brand and with every messaging that I'm going to do. And I literally say concept, I say settings, I say who's going to be in it and what the key messaging is going to be that will bring this visual to life. And most of the time, I can't say I ever got pushed back in the sense of, you know, can you also include this, 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 this. They kind of get it based off of just how I'm presenting the idea or the concept to them. And I make sure to also kind of write it in a way where 
I know that this is what's going to work with my audience and this is authentic to us and this is just going to be the best way to create and how to make this message come to life through our content. So that's what we normally do to kind of not have so much like of an awkward crime, like, oh, no, well, I'm not going to do this or we can't do this. Instead of having that conversation, I kind of just beat them to the chase and just say, look, I think this is a great idea. Let's do this. And most of the time they agree. They might want to tweak. They might want to at a point here or there, but they've I've never been pressed to have that whole three pager. And I think we're moving into a time where brands are definitely starting to understand that where we are receiving their brief and it's not as long and lengthy as it was maybe two years ago. Well, that's no, that that's promising. And that's encouraging to hear that, you know, things are improving. Any other uh, points that you can think of good recommendations of how to work with a channel like yours? I also think it's great to find out why you chose to partner with us or want to, you know, reach out. So it kind of helps you as a, as a creator to see like, okay, you know, what are we doing? Well, what are we not doing? Like getting that feedback is great. Sometimes you, you create this content and you don't know how it was translated or received on their end. That's one. And I would say another one would be... To make sure that, you know, and specifically relating to us, the fact that you want to help contribute to the LGBTQ plus community in representation, in visibility, and it's not just a one and done partnership. Right. And that's, that's fascinating. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, we live in the age of, of Twitter and the age of social media, right? And, you know, brands, to their credit, I think, are acknowledging that they need to have more representation. They need to have more diversity in everything that they're doing. And, and I mean, up until this point, I think that there really hasn't been a lot of accountability for them to be this way. And so I think it's great to see them doing this. But at the same time, like you mentioned, you know, you shouldn't be doing it just for that sake. There should be a, a larger purpose behind it, right? So that's fascinating. So if you had to name a dream brand that you would love to partner with one day, do you have that brand in your mind already? Yeah. Nike would definitely be a dream brand for us. They have already been breaking so many barriers and just really showing great representation and what their beliefs are and what they are as a brand through just seeing them, how they're working with different celebrities and so forth and the messaging that is coming out through them. But Nike would be a dream brand for us, especially since Denise and I have been on our health kick for a very long time. (laughs) Absolutely love it. Well, Nike, if you're listening, make sure to reach out to Ebony and Denise. No, please. Hello. You know, Showing how everyday moms wear your stuff. Come on. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, well, to that point, you know, I, first of all, I mean, thank you so much for joining me today. I think this has been a really fascinating conversation. So how can people find you? Like, what are your channel URLs? That kind of thing. Yes, you can find us on YouTube at Team Two Moms, as well as Instagram is Team Two Moms, and our Twitter is Olivia Has Two Moms because that was our original name when we first started on this social media journey. So, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. And and thank you so much again. You've just listened to the Sponsored Post podcast with your host, Justin Moore. You can subscribe to hear more great interviews and episodes via iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. For more information on Trending Family, you can visit www.trendingfamily.com. And we'll see you next time. Yay. Thank you.